At Staples Business Advantage, our team of experts can help you find the break room products to satisfy everyone's preferences, while AI can suggest popular items, monitor stock levels, optimize pricing, and automate reordering. AI can do a lot of things, but I can never know the taste of a truly great cup of coffee. Sigh. But you also can't get hangry. This is true. Let Staples Business Advantage use today's latest innovations plus our team's experience to make stocking your team's break room easier for you. Sign up today and save 20%. Staples Business Advantage. Business is human. Shares for Beginners. Weekend Watch List. G'day and welcome back to Shares for Beginners Weekend Watch List, where we'll be taking a close look at an individual company, sector or ETF that you may wish to consider for your watch list. It's not a recommendation to buy, but a way for you to learn how experts screen for value. Joining me today is Kyle McIntyre from Firetrail Investments. G'day, Kyle. G'day, Phil. Today we're talking about oil search, and the ASX code is OSH, an oil explorer with a very depressed share price at the moment. Why is that? Yeah, yeah, good question, Phil. It is very cheap at the moment today relative to where it's traded historically and also relative to global peers. And interestingly, you know, what you've seen in the Australian listed space is that the Australian energy names have actually underperformed their global peers by around 20 to 30% year to date, depending on the underlying company. Now, the reason global peers have been performing well over the last 12 months is they've been reacting to moves in energy prices. You know, the oil price is sitting at around 75 US dollars a barrel for Brent today. 12 months ago, it was sitting around 45 US dollars a barrel. So it's interesting that the Aussie peers have underperformed and oil search has actually underperformed those Aussie peers. So if you look at oil search over the last 12 months, it was sitting around $3.80 a year ago. Um, and today it's only sitting around $4. And when you consider that move from $45 per barrel to $75 per barrel of the underlying oil price, yeah, it's, it's actually moved $30 higher. So the product that they they sell, um, oil and gas, they are linked. You know, it's gone thirty dollars higher, and the underlying fundamentals for oil search have actually gotten stronger. And, and to give you an amazing stat, for every five dollar increase in the price of oil per barrel, it roughly equates to around one hundred million dollars to oil search's cash flow. So, oil search's cash flow is up around six hundred million dollars, but the share price hasn't moved. So, I suppose the question is, why is that? For me, there's a few key things going on. Number one, you've got the Aussie peers have been underperforming their global peers. So there's something explicitly happening in the Australian market, which could be, in my view, a potential opportunity to buy these assets in Australia cheaper than you can their global peers. But there's also been a couple of things going on specific to oil search as well. You know, you've had some risks in Papua New Guinea where they operate, some geopolitical risks there, some political risks in Alaska, which is a potential growth option for them. And you've also had a large shareholder who owned around 10% of oil search selling down um, over the last few months. Now, you know, a lot of those things are behind it now. And, and, you know, I do think moving forward, there is a potential opportunity, at least in my view, in oil search, which is a world-class, high-quality oil and gas asset. So the cost for production for oil search is pretty good compared to all of their oil producing and oil exploration peers? Yeah, they've got some of the best assets in the world. So when you think about oil search, it's broken into four key assets. They've got three assets in PNG, Papua New Guinea, and one in Alaska. And their key asset is Papua New Guinea asset in LNG, so in liquefied natural gas, um, which is basically just gas that's been cooled to a liquid state to allow for shipping and for storage. And so they also own other assets in PNG, some oil and gas assets in PNG, but I'd say this large uh, LNG project is the big one. And then they've got a couple of growth options as well that are actually undeveloped. So they're actually not producing assets. They've got a stake in Alaska, um, in a large oil field in Pika, and they've also got another Papua LNG asset there. So of the producing assets, you know, the PNG LNG asset is the key producing asset and it is a really high quality asset. And when you look at their break even for that asset, it's around $15 for 
an equivalent barrel of oil. It's around $15 a barrel for that asset to be break even. So, Wow, <laughs> that's so cheap. It's a world-class asset when you consider the current price of oil at around you know, $70, $75 a barrel. So what's holding back the price of oil search at the moment in Australia? It's really interesting. I think one of the big reasons it's been held back is some of the risks in PNG in Papua New Guinea. You know, Papua New Guinea has been a relatively stable place to invest for energy and commodity players until the last few years. And what changed was a new prime minister that came in, James Marape. He came in with an agenda to take back PNG, is what he called it. And basically, his underlying platform was to take back some of the key assets that they have in PNG and basically look to nationalise them. And he actually started to do this. He took back a um, gold mine called Porjira, which was operated by a, a global gold player called Barrick Gold. This was a, a couple of years ago. There was a subsequent lawsuit and the outcome of that was basically Barrick was going to walk away and stop operating the asset <laughs> and Subsequently, Papua New Guinea has, have come in and asked Barrick to come back in and operate the asset. So, you know, I, I think what they've seen is that they do need some of this international expertise to be able to operate these assets. You know, in terms of the impact to oil search, you know, it, it increased the geopolitical risk there. But what we've seen is a pretty rational response now and, and a rational outcome to what happened there with the Barrick Gold example. So I think that was probably weighing on the share price a little bit. The other key thing that's been happening with oil search is they do have this really large potential opportunity in an Alaskan oil field. And one question I've been receiving from a lot of investors is what does a Biden administration mean for this Alaskan asset that we can run through all of these assets in a bit more detail if you like. But if I was to summarize it, you know, there is no impact from a Biden administration coming in where potential investors can get confused is the difference in Alaska between federally owned land and Alaskan owned land. Right. So yeah, it's a bit of a state-based thing and federal-based thing, isn't it? Yeah, correct. And so what you've seen is on federal-based land in Alaska, where there are oil and gas assets, they are not being developed. But what you've seen is that Alaskan-based assets, which the oil search asset is, it's actually fine to go ahead. And they've actually got all the approvals for Alaska to go ahead. An interesting thing about Alaska, actually, when you look into the country, is that Alaskans are actually heavily incentivized to like oil. They've actually got a national fund where basically every single Alaskan receives a dividend payment from the oil assets. Really? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. They receive a dividend payment. It's quite large. It's something like 1400 to 1600 US dollars per annum that they receive. And it's an annual thing. They actually have a really big party when it comes to check day, I guess you call it. But Alaskans are definitely incentivized to like oil, they're incentivized to have oil projects going on there. And, and this project does have all the approvals they need to move forward. So you mentioned about um, wanting to go into a bit more detail on some of the other assets. Were there any other ones that you wanted to mention? Or Well, I thought, why don't I go into a bit of detail on PNG, LNG, because it's such an interesting asset. And I thought, you know, let's do a bit of a deep dive into some of these different projects. So let me set this up for you and give you why this is such a world-class asset. The first is it's really long life, so it's expected to produce all the way out to 2050. Really low cost. I spoke to the break-evens before, so $15 a barrel. But the key thing is it's it's also very close to their key customers as well. So the reason PNG is, is so attractive is because it's very, very close to some of the key consumers of liquefied natural gas, which are predominantly in Asian-based countries. And so they've got some really strong long-term Asian customers. Their key customers are in China, they're in Japan, they're in Taiwan. And PNG is perfectly located to be able to ship gas um, out of there to Asia, which is responsible for around, I think it's about 70% of total gas imports go into China. So it's in an absolute cracking location and it's a world-class asset and it's also operated by one of the best operators in the world so exxon actually operates this asset so oil search don't actually operate the asset and in fact they're not even the largest shareholder in the asset so they own 29 percent 
of the asset, Exxon owned just over 30%, 33%, and the balance is between the government and a couple of other smaller owners. But, you know, when you consider when this asset was set up, it was expected to deliver around 6.9 million tonnes per annum in what's called nameplate capacity. So when you build one of these plants, you come out with all your different studies and one of the things you come out with is your nameplate capacity, which is what it's expected to produce. It's currently operating at around 30% above that nameplate capacity. So, you know, Exxon, absolute best in the business when it comes to operating and very, very consistently delivering above nameplate production year in, year out. Exxon tend to under promise or, or, or say nothing, but once they're in, you know, they don't tend to deviate from the plan and, and they tend to be very, very strong on execution. It's also got some really strong contracts. So I mentioned some of those different areas that they ship to, but some of their biggest Asian customers are massive firms like Tokyo Electric Power Company, Osaka Gas Limited, Sinopec, CPC Corporation in Taiwan. And you've got some really attractive high price contracts all the way out to 2034. So you've got quite a lot of certainty um, coming through in this asset. And then you've also got some oil in this asset as well. So around 13% of the revenue from this um, project comes through from oil as well, which tends to be higher margin when you find them under this sort of sort of structure. So it, it really is a world-class asset. So that's a reason to like oil search. But the reason to get excited about it into the future is some of these new projects that they've got in the pipeline. They've got two key greenfield projects. They've got Papua LNG, which is a new project in a similar area. It is co-located, but this project is going to be big. We're talking, if you were to look at it on a 100% basis, it's going to be around $12 billion in capex to get this thing going. Now, in reality, Oil Search only owns around 18% of this project. But again, it's operated by one of the best in the business. It's a French operator called Total. They own just under 30% of Papua LNG. They've agreed to share infrastructure on the processing component. So they're going to share infrastructure between Oil Search, Exxon and Total, who are all shareholders within it. And I think if I was to take a step back and think about what's one of the key opportunities to realise some of the valuation potential in Oil Search, you know, Total would be a natural acquirer of oil search in my view, particularly given you look at the Total business, they did have a large project in Mozambique that they were going to go ahead with that they're no longer able to go ahead with because of geopolitical risks. So this really is the next big thing on the horizon for Total as a company. And so so they will be focusing all their attentions on it. This is going to have all their focus. Yeah, that's exactly right. And, and it probably makes sense. You know, if I look at the key owners in there, you've got Exxon, Total, Oil Search. The one to me that stands out is, is Oil Search. It could be a natural potential acquisition for someone like a Total coming in there. And then you've got Alaska that I mentioned to you before. Alaska, some of the best oil fields in the world. You know, they've got a saying in oil, the best place to find oil is near other oil. And Oil Search really hit the jackpot. They found the third largest oil field in Alaska called Picker. They own 51% of it. They're aiming to sell down and make a final investment decision by the end of the year. And they're expecting the first oil to come out of this project by 2025. And as I mentioned, they've got all the approvals for it. They've got some really good technology up in Alaska that they're using. That means you've got less land disruption. You've got more of the underlying asset that you can capture through new drilling techniques. And in my view, it's actually a pretty good time for an oil project. You know, it's not like you're in Australia trying to build a house in regional Australia or trying to get a tradie to come and do work during lockdown. You know, there hasn't been much investment in oil projects, which we've spoken to in the past, Phil, and, you know, utilisation of rigs is down. So it's actually, in my view, a pretty attractive time to be investing in an oil project and particularly given where the oil price is today. So, you know, if they can sell down that stake 51% to get to around 35%, that's going to reduce the CapEx bill. It's going to give the market some confidence. And I think that will be a really high quality, world-class asset that they've got in Alaska as well. So a pretty exciting growth potential, but already operating some pretty high quality assets here in Papua New Guinea as well. That's great. So should we do a disclosure at this stage? 
I will disclose that at Firetrail, oil search is a key holding across our portfolios. But that can change at any time as well, can't it? Yeah, that's, that's exactly right. And I suppose, you know, if I take a step back, that holding is driven by our medium term view on oil, you know, given we do expect oil demand to stay pretty consistent over the next decade, despite EVs coming through, that's modelling out and factoring in the fact that EVs could make up around 40% of new car sales by 2030. You know, we still expect alternative sources for transport, whether it's shipping, aviation, trucking, etc., to make up some of the slack. And we expect robust oil demand over the next 10 years. But you've seen huge underinvestment in supply of oil coming on and in a commodity. If you have pretty constant demand and you have falling supply, a pretty rational response to that is for there to be higher prices in that underlying commodity. So in the end, it does come back to the underlying commodity. And and I mentioned at the start of this, the leverage that oil search has to higher energy prices. You know, in my view, you're getting three key things with oil search. You're getting the leverage and the exposure to an attractive commodity in our view you're getting it at a cheap price and you're also getting potential growth optionality in some of these new projects that are coming on. So it ticks a lot of the boxes for a high conviction position in our portfolios. Carl McIntyre, thanks very much for joining us today. Thanks, Phil. Shares for Beginners is for information and educational purposes only. It isn't financial advice and you shouldn't buy or sell any investments based on what you've heard here. Any opinion or commentary is the view of the speaker only, not shares for beginners. This podcast doesn't replace professional advice regarding your personal financial needs, circumstances or current situation. And thank you for listening to my podcast. With Staples Business Advantage, you get the benefit of thousands of experts. Plus optimizations powered by the latest technological innovations. One plus one equals two. Three. Whatever. Sign up today and save 20%. Staples Business Advantage. Business is human.